Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Oneida is just right across the river from uh, the Chippewa of the Thames, and we saw that earlier um, today in a, a slide presentation. Uh, I am from the Wolf Clan and the Haudenosaunee. We are a matrilineal society. Uh, and today, it's my very great pleasure to introduce some young people. So I'm just going to be reading some quotes that I highlighted from my essay. Instead of reading it all, it'd be more easier. So, uh, so I started off by saying, people need clean water to live. 112 First Nations out of 633 do not have safe drinking water in Canada. Without clean drinking water, we wouldn't be able to, to survive on Earth. And that's just the first line. Then I highlighted another one later on, and I just put, it's our job to make a better and cleaner future by helping your commu community stay green. And then, being in Anishinaabe Kwesas, I have many responsibilities and a huge role in the health of the water. Speaking up for the water and attending water walks are just a few things I can do to take care of it. And then I continue saying more about the water walk, but yeah. Taking the time to do little things for the environment can have a huge impact. For example, if we start recycling and reducing our waste consumption, it can help the earth greatly. Becoming a steward for the earth will help the environment and encourage others to respect earth more. Creating balance and following the seven grandfather teachings will begin a new era of an amazing, healthy, and safe future for everyone. And that's uh, what I highlighted from my essay. <laughs> I highlighted some parts as well. And um, yeah. uh, the first one is, Mother Earth is so important. Because she provides us with the necessities we need to survive, she keeps my family and I alive and healthy. And um, second part, I have a role and responsibility to fulfill. Caring and watching out for Shkak Mekwe because we all need to help protect her, to be her voice, her protector, respect her in every way, give thanks for what we have around us already. She has given t so much to us, and now we have to give back. And that's about it. Ani, wa say ni kwe kwe dish na kaz, makwa dodam, get kanzi bi donjpa. Hello, good afternoon. My name is my English name is Sydney Nolan, um, but my spirit name is Oncoming Storm Cloud. I am of the Bear Clan. I'm 17 years old, and I come from the Ojibwe territory of Garden River First Nation. Um, it's located between the Three Great Lakes and also about 10 minutes uh, east of Sault Ste. Marie. Um, currently, I'm finishing off my uh, final year as a high school student and recently completed my B1 Delft testing for French as a second language. Um, thanks. Uh, I come from a large family of nine people and I'm the eldest of seven children. Um, my mom and my grandparents are the people that really opened my eyes to climate change and our traditional ways. So I was trying to think about when I first started to notice climate change and think about what I, I was doing, like my, my part in trying to conserve the earth. And I think it started like, about grade four, my friend dropped um, a rice, cri rice crispy package on the ground, and I picked it up because, like, my parents always taught me to treat others the way you would like to be treated, and um, I thought, like, the earth gives us so many things. Like, it's beautiful. Like, we have all these sceneries. We have the food, our water, like the flowers, and the least I could do is pick up a piece of garbage. 
Um, a lot of the time, my family and I participate in water ceremonies and water walks. Our home in Garden River First Nation overlooks the St. Mary's River, which drains from Lake Superior. Um, the St. Mary's starts at the end of Whitefish Bay and flows about 75 miles southeast into Lake Huron. In fact, the Garden River also flows into the St. Mary's. Um, at home in Sault Ste. Marie, a steel factory by the name of SR Steel continues to contaminate and pollute our water and also um, our air. Another issue is the sewage in Sault Ste. Marie, which is dumped into our waters daily. Um, my parents talked to me a lot about where they used to swim, like their swimming holes and what they used to do when they were my age. And a lot of that, like the water's too dirty to swim, so we never... We're, we can swim, but like it's, it's not the best water, it's dirty. And um, recently in the Sioux, we go hiking along um, the Lake Superior. It's called Grope Cap, and it's a bunch of bluffs, and it's like a really long hiking trail, but they had to close it down for the public because um, too much pollute, like people are polluting too much. People are polluting in the water, so completely like, closed it for the public, and it was really sad because it's like such a nice place. Um, uh, sorry, okay, so. Did you know that the Great Lakes area is home to 35 million people, including my family, which means it houses a great deal of untreated raw sewage. In fact, the amount of raw sewage that's dumped into these lakes every year is equivalent to more than 1.2 million Olympic-sized swimming pools. What's more, a number of chemicals such as detergents, insect repellents, and even some over-the-counter medication can survive the wastewater treatment process and are found in abundant numbers throughout these bodies of water. The Great Lakes combined account for around 20% of the entire world's freshwater supply, which is why keeping them, keeping them clean is the utmost importance. These lakes are all one system, yet each one has its own unique characteristic that make dealing with water pollution different. Only around 1% of the water in the Great Lakes combined leaves their basins each year. So this means that once pollutants enter them, they tend to stay there for a great deal of time and may even become more concentrated as the years pass. Solutions to end water pollution, like these are my ideas. So, for example, like not supporting the factories that are polluting. So a big one is Nestle. They, they're the ones that caused the um, drought in 2015 in California. And that's really big to cause a drought in like a whole state. Um, also, another solution is to try leaning yourself away from plastic. So maybe try using a glass water bottle instead of a plastic one. Plastic contains chemicals that spread into groundwater. Also chemicals added to plastic are absorbed by human bodies. Some of these compounds have been found to alter hormones or have other potential human health effects. Also floating plastic waste, which can survive for thousands of years, act as a mini transportation for invasive species, which disrupt habitats. Also, um, bio, or sorry, plastic does not biodegrade. Um, the last solution I have for the earth and water pollution is to just pray, or like to give an offering. As an Anishinaabe woman, I was taught that, um, or I was given teachings about how to always offer prayer or just your thoughts about the well-being of the water and we need water to survive, so just even a small thank you when you're getting your glass or just giving your positive thoughts to your water really helps. And lastly, I would like to remind everyone that when we come together for these discussions, we talk in a positive way, we speak with good intentions, and we seek equality for all First Nations communities in Canada, so we hope all Canadians join us. So with that, please think before you act. In every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations to come. Miigwech.
Hello, Anim, Minande, Baneshi, Kwe, Dijnakaz, Gitsagan, ZB, Donjaba, Makwa, Dodam, or sorry, no, Gigo, Dodam. I was told when I was younger that I was bear, and then as I got older, it turned out to be fish. So, still going through that transition. I have a list of like experiences that I've had throughout my life, um, both educational wise and non education wise. The way I wanted to start was by telling this story about how I first experienced passion for the environment, which my mom, Sue Chiblow over there, took me to a meeting um, with NWMO, which is the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, blah, blah, blah. And I don't remember where it was. She took me to a couple of them, but there was this one lady speaking about how the government came in. I don't even know. I think she was from the States. She came in and she was saying that the government said that they wanted to put the waste near First Nations reserves because, you know, we'll tell our children to stay away as opposed to in a city, they, they won't. And I just, that made me so angry. It was like an array of feelings, sadness, because I was like, now we have to deal with this, even though it's all of our problem, not just our people, but they're focusing on giving it to us. So that's where my inspiration for biology became apparent. I decided to Originally, I chose environmental studies to go to school. Well, I switched to biology because it wasn't my thing. And when I switched, you know, I had to take um, a variety of classes. I took some sociology classes. I took environmental policy classes and all of these different kinds. And in my sociology class, I think, was the first exposure I had to people not knowing even that we exist. This lady was talking, and she was like, oh, I... Uh, I just think that these native people, you know, they're just trying to hunt the, for their meal and just trying to survive. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm right here. Um, I didn't like hunt my meal this morning. I just cooked some eggs that I got from the grocery store. And like they were just completely blown away that that was an actual thing. I couldn't believe that people actually really believed that we were still just hunting and all of that gathering for food. But then my second experience with um, people being uneducated about not just us, but pretty much being outside, pretty much. I took an ecology class. <laughs> and you'd think ecology class, you know, maybe you'd go outside more than once, you know, because it's ecology, you've got to experience the land, you gotta, you're learning through a textbook. Well, our first lab, everyone was like, wow, this is amazing. We went to this place called Ojibwe Parkway. It's outside of Windsor. And, well, it's, it's nice. I mean, there's not a river there. There used to be like a little creek, but it's all dried up. It's pretty much just mud. And there's pavement everywhere. It's not really like, it's just like a, you know, like a colonized park. I didn't really think it was that pretty. All these people were like freaking out like, wow, this is amazing. It's so beautiful. And I was like, oh, oh no. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And then the second time we got to go outside for ecology class, we were picking <laughs> pine needles in, on campus. So we didn't really, I don't think that really counts as going outside. And all these people, they were so, like, people were picking them. I was like, ask my teacher, because they wanted us to pick them off the tree. I was like, why can't we pick them off the ground? Like, it's spring. I think it was spring. And they said, no, you have to pick them from the tree. Otherwise, it won't be whatever. I don't know. They had some scientific reason. So we had, I put my tobacco down to take away these pine needles. But these people were looking at me like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm thanking the tree. We're taking things away. This is like its skin type thing. This is how it breathes and functions. And they were like, what? Like, they didn't understand. There was no connection between the fact that they were living creatures as opposed to just a scientific object that we were studying, which I didn't, I didn't really like that. And I noticed that a lot of the times in a lot of my classes, that's what the focus was, is more opposed to actually, you know, that these are living entities that we're learning about and that they do all of these things for us. It's more of, like, creates oxygen, you know, not like we breathe this oxygen. It's just a different approach that I was um, kind of shocked because my mom's taught me, like, you know, we experience everything. Um, I have, there, you know, these are my experiences with schooling, and not all of them are negative. I do have one positive experience about, well, not just one, <laughs> but this one that comes to mind. I had this really good prof. She was, uh, she's very open, and she's all about, like, as opposed to just regurgitating and regurgitating about understanding. So she had us write a paper explaining to a non-scientist person uh, climate change and how it affects us. So I chose my niece, who I think is how old? Nine? She's nine-ish. And I chose to write a paper to her. So I did really well on the paper. You know, I explained, like, you know, we, I, 
I want to, you got to keep the land clean so that you can go swimming as like the places that I get to go swimming and you can do all of these things that I got to do when I was younger and you can fish and all of those things. I did really well. It was a peer reviewed paper. So this person, I don't know who obviously, um, reviewed my paper and just tore it right apart saying I didn't have any scientific background and like there was no like proof behind what I was saying and all of these things. And so we got to submit it again and explaining why or like why we chose to change according to what the peer review person said or to not change. Well, I didn't change anything because I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> and so did my prof because I got 100%. <laughs> and I just can't wait to read it to Taya because I think it is very important for even people younger than I am. Like I'm 22 and there's people even younger than I am that are into the environment. It's good to see because that way we know, like I it gives me more hope because it, it's really hard when you're going through um, a system where they're kind of taking that connection away from you as opposed to like helping you experience the connection with the land and all of those things. I think that's really important when it comes to learning about it. Another class I had, I thought, I thought this was kind of funny. It was animal communication. And instead of going outside and listening to the birds, we had to listen to recordings on a computer. <laughs> and I was like, we can hear them out there. No, no, okay, no. I thought that was kind of strange, not going to lie. <laughs> and yeah, another one I think which was um, my first time taking like any types of environmental policy course or learning about environmental policy in like the fact of actually reading through things as opposed to just what my mom would say. Well, <laughs> she says a lot, you know. <laughs> So I took an environmental policy and politics course and on the exam, you know, I wasn't really expecting them to ask like such specific questions about each clause and laws and direct. I was thinking more like, you know, they'd ask, you know, what was, should be happening. So I was going through this exam and the way they had it set up is that you were given three shots to get the right answer. And the first one for the first couple questions, I got so wrong because the answer that they gave that I said was what I thought should be right. So for example, like, you know, you protect the water in, in a certain way that we would. And then when you, I got the question wrong, obviously it was wrong. And the one that I thought was the absolute worst was the one that was right. And I thought that was just crazy that it's polar opposite of what should be happening as opposed to what is happening. It's, it's not for actual protection, it's not helping. That was uh, pretty crazy to see. I have quite a lot of notes. <laughs> Another example, I guess, would be my mom took me and we also went with Sylvia Plain on two-row wampum canoe journey down in New York. We paddled the Hudson River and ended, ended in Manhattan, right downtown. It was actually really cool. But I think one thing that was strange to me, because, you know, that was only my second year in university, I was still kind of getting used to the fact that people weren't as open and caring for the environment as we were. This lady came up and asked us, I don't know where my mom was, she came and asked me um, in particular how, like what we're doing and like why is it so important? And I was like, well, you know, the Two Row Wampum Treaty is, we're supposed to be living together side by side, going down the river and not interpassing, like not crossing over and not interfering with each other. But when you get onto that river, it smells so bad, I was almost getting sick. It smelled like pure sewage. The birds wouldn't land in it. And then you go um, to look in the swimming area, it says like swimming is okay, uh, but you don't eat the fish. And I'm like, well, why would you want to swim if you can't even eat the fish? And this lady was like, well, it's not that bad. And I was like, what? Like there's a plant, a nuclear plant right there that's dumping into the water that you can actually see it from where we were standing. And I was like, I, I, I had to walk away. I couldn't even talk to her. I was like, mom, answer this woman. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I was just like, wow, I was in awe that like, people actually don't have any education on that this is happening. Like, she had no idea that this was even happening, and it was right down the road from where she lives. So my main point today is that I think our education system, or at least my experiences through the education system, is kind of taking away from the connection of the land. Like, for example, when I go into the bush, you know, we're driving in my mom's Jeep, and it's like as soon as you get past the area where the, the trees come, it's like there's like a whole burden like taken away and all of a sudden everything doesn't, all of the problems that are happening are no longer problems and you just feel so comfortable no matter where you are. 
And I think that's really important for people to experience when they're learning biology, especially ecology-related things, because that way they, have, they experience the connection that they're supposed to have to the land, which they, a lot of people aren't experiencing, which, as I said, like my ecology class, well, we went, went outside twice out of all of our labs. And you would think in that, those types of classes that they would let you experience those things more so instead of just through a textbook. I don't think that a textbook really gives you any type of connection and you don't really learn that much through a textbook. You just regurgitate what they want you to, to hear and to say. I just, I don't know. I think that we gotta get them younger. I think starting in elementary school, teaching them and bringing them outside is a good thing. Education is very important. In elementary school, I only went outside, I think, with our school once, and it was to go to some camp, and we had to do a competition. It was like a little competition on who could build the fire the fastest, who could build uh, like a shelter the fastest. Well, I won. <laughs> Apparently, I was the only one that went outside that year. <laughs> Same thing happened in high school. It blew me away. It took those people two hours to be able to start a fire and they were given a lighter, they were given kindling and I was sitting there and we were all done, me and my friends, because we were like a team of native people and we were just watching them like, wow, they're really struggling, it's not even windy, it's not <laughs> raining, I didn't understand. <laughs> so I thank my mom for giving me all those experiences and teaching me that through actually being outside, I learned a lot more than I learned in the classroom and I think that's really important, getting the kids out, out into the bush and having them experience the connection that you feel and how it, being out there makes you feel, how feeling the water makes you feel. I think that's really important when it comes to any type of environment-related problem. There was a couple of things that um, stood out for me when these, uh, these young women were speaking. And um, it's about their culture. And it clearly identif they identify themselves with the land and with some of those responsibilities and those teachings that they're learning. And so I see that there, there are you know, some similarities throughout some of the talks um, that we've even heard this morning where you know, we've been talking about what are some of those responsibilities that we have and that we share and that you know, we're continuing to learn and, and pass down. And as you can see that um, a lot of this is happening with, uh, with our young women today. And so I think that we're just really honored to, to be able to, to have that intersection here today with academia, with young people um, and, and people of all ages. Uh, and being able to take away some of those really um, key messages that I think that we often forget when we're, we're busy at our desks from 9 to 5 or whatever our jobs may be. So um, again, thank you very much.